I had a beautiful talk prepared for you all today. I felt that it ticked almost every single box that would make for a truly inspirational speech that I could be proud of. But according to the Scottish poet Robert Burns, the best laid schemes of mice and men gang aft agly. And according to me, strange things sometimes happen in bathtubs. So in true Burns fashion, on the fourth month anniversary of Lyra's murder, I decided that I didn't want to talk about that anymore. You see, so much had happened in those four short months that I got to a place where I felt that I had to do something to change the world, to change Northern Ireland. I felt responsible for ensuring that no one ever died at the hands of terrorists in our country again, even if that meant publicly supporting her killers in coming forward. And I felt that if I didn't succeed, that somehow I would have failed, Lyra. Now, I know what you're thinking. No pressure then, Nicola. But that is honestly how I felt. And so I spent endless hours constructing and rehearsing a talk that I felt would help me achieve that mission. But on the 18th of August, I realized that I wasn't alone in my mission. I realized that we had been united in this communal mission from the very beginning, and that I had just temporarily forgotten. So what made me forget? The shock, the grief, the endless pressure of having to deal with everything that Lyra left behind, and throw into that mix some very irresponsible news coverage and you could be forgiven for forgetting, just like I did, that anything good had ever happened in my life. But then something happened, something which activated my memory. You see, my nieces who live in County Mayo on the west coast of Ireland wanted to do something to honor Lyra, for they had known each other most of their lives and had played together as children. And that something became the ancient Christian pilgrimage from Ballantubber to Croke Patrick, which is a 35-kilometer walk through the Mayo countryside. And it ends with a hike up a mountain. And it's believed to have been followed by St. Patrick, Ireland's patron saint. So although I'm not Christian, I am very open to all kinds of spiritual practices, and I'm particularly interested in those of the ancient people. And because it was in memory of Lyra, I was game. So for those of you who don't know anything about this pilgrimage, a bit like me, because I didn't do any research before I left, <laughs> it begins in the beautiful scene of the Ballantubber Abbey. The scene is beautiful, quite picturesque. It's like a place that time forgot. And you're met there by this really lovely priest who gives you advice on how to proceed on your pilgrimage. And he gives everyone a stone, a stone that is supposed to represent something that you want to let go of as you go about your journey. And he leaves you with two very, very ap apparently simple rules. One, no complaining. <laughs> and two, stay together. Now, let me tell you, the first rule was broken in less than 15 minutes, <laughs> if not five. And the second rule was broken just a little bit later. You see, when I agreed to join the walk because of the lack of research, I assumed that I would just be walking down a road. I didn't really know what lay ahead. And so I found myself tramping through squishy boglands and crossing rivers and climbing hills. At one point, we even had to roll under an electric fence. And I thought I was being trained secretly as a spy. 
But my favorite moment had to be when all of these wonderful people joined together in their improvised impressions of Olympic athletes as they tried to outrun a stampede of angry cows <laughs> who did not want them in their field. But at one point, I found myself at the front of the group and I got talking to a man called Matty. He was 65 and I was really interested to know what made him join the walk. And so I asked him. And he said that he was so saddened by Lyra's murder that he felt that he had to do something to show solidarity with the family, to show solidarity with the people of the North, and that he really just wanted to make a statement. And I was speechless, which if you knew me, you would know is very unusual. His words didn't sink in then because I was too busy worrying about sinking into the bogs. But I recorded them in my mind for later. And so the walk continued, difficult at times, pleasant in others, but when you're with a group of amazing people, it doesn't really matter. And then we were faced with it, the mountain that I have affectionately dubbed the beast. And as I stood at the bottom of this mountain, looking up at it in the pouring rain, I really didn't know what to expect because I had never climbed a mountain before, not even in dry weather. But I wasn't given up. And even though other people decided not to do it, I was determined. And I unzipped my jacket and I was wearing this very t-shirt and I said, I'm doing it because failure is not an option. Like some demented middle-aged superhero. <laughs> and so off we went, climbing. It was a bit difficult, I have to say, but we did eventually get to the top. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> And I thought, that's it, we've made it, job done. But then we had to calm down again. And not long into the descent, the weather turned against us. And the sun decided to go to sleep early. And very quickly, the priest's second rule was broken. And the group was divided. And we lost sight of our guide altogether. And then just for a little bit of extra fun, hail joined us on the mountainside. We discovered we had no signals on our phones, so all we could do was have my husband standing like this, shining his light up and down the mountain to try to alert other people to our presence. And I just decided I would just sit here and I would just wait for the sun to come up and I had my niece, Leontia, on my knee, and I just kept singing, she'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. Because I truly believe that hysteria had set in by that point. But luckily, we were discovered, believe it or not, just as the phone was about to die. And with 200 meters left to go of the walk, all of the walkers had united once more. But with 100 meters left, we had a little bit of a surprise because we were met by the Mayo Mountain Rescue Team who had been alerted to our little disaster on the mountainside. And all I could think about was, please do not put this in the news. And I could picture it, a picture of me on the front page wrapped in tin foil, which I was, cursing St. Patrick, which I was, <laughs> with the caption or the headline, Lyra's Walkers Rescued. My nerves were absolutely wrecked. But we were all safe, and of course, I was very grateful for that. But somehow, I felt let down by the experience, because I still had my stone. And so I thought I must have missed something 
because I hadn't let anything go at all. And so although I had succeeded, albeit with a little bit of help at the end, I felt that I'd failed. And so I was thinking about all this on the 18th of August as I was nursing my extremely sore muscles in a hot bath in Belfast. And I was truly and utterly miserable. So to distract myself, I decided to rehearse my talk because, you know, TEDx Stormont was less than two weeks away and I had to get it right because I was doing it for Lyra. But that was when it dawned on me that the message that I had intended to share about how we have to rise above and look beyond socially constructed labels was something that the vast majority of the people in our country and beyond already demonstrate as part of their daily life. And once my mind was opened, it was like a Pandora's box, and I remembered all of the wonderful demonstrations of solidarity that occurred after Lyra's murder. I remembered the vigils, the funeral, which was as close to a state funeral that you could get for just a little girl from North Belfast. I remembered all the amazing people that organized and took part in the walk, from the three-day walk from Belfast to the Stroke City, or as our Lyra liked to call it, legendary, which is no mean feat in comparison to my miserable mileage. But like, I did walk a mountain as well. And I remembered everything, all of the tributes, the awards, all of the kind people, the condolence book messages, and I remembered Maddie's words. It was like all of these thoughts were being downloaded from some invisible computer somewhere. And I realized then that anyone who took part in any or all of these events, even people who just sent us a prayer, had already shown that they believe that we're all one and that labels mean absolutely nothing to them. And so this remembering made the arguments in my very carefully constructed talk totally pointless. And so I threw it in the fire, literally, and decided to start again. Because I realized that we've always been in this together. And I also realized that it's not my responsibility alone to change the world. And I realized that it is our humanity that unites us and that we are compelled to support each other in times of need by our very human nature. Now, when reflecting on all of this, what really fires up my imagination is the potential the potential of what we can achieve if we continue to demonstrate our inherent inclusive nature, just as we did in the aftermath of Lyra's murder. And I began to see our pilgrimage as a kind of metaphor for what lies ahead. Because you see, just like the pilgrim's gates, there are forces outside of this room that seek to draw our attention away from what unites us. Ironically, using the word unity as their banner. And we can't let that happen. We must not let those who seek to separate us to succeed. We must liberate ourselves once and for all from their threat and the threats of others like them to our peace. We must reclaim the word unity for its rightful purpose. You see, some people have lost sight of the true meaning. They don't really understand what it means. Because for me, 
Unity goes way beyond land. It goes way beyond nationality and it goes beyond labels. To me, unity is a feeling. It's a feeling that leads to the outpouring of love that we saw in the aftermath of Lyra's murder. And it is natural, unity is natural, and we respond with unity to disasters. Unity is what the world demonstrated in response to Lyra's murder. And we must continue to build upon it. We must embrace it as our way of life and build on the momentum that was harnessed in April to make sure that we have the peaceful world that we've imagined. You see, a wise man once said that any intelligent fool can make things bigger, more complex, and more violent. But it takes a touch of genius, a little bit of imagination, and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction. Let us leave here today dedicated to becoming courageous geniuses, dedicated to working towards the peace that we were promised and the peace that we should have for all those who come after us. Lyra McKee will never be able to enjoy the peace, the peace that was promised in 1998, but we must make sure that her life was not in vain by securing peace as her lasting legacy. We must take into our hearts the motto that adorned her t-shirt as she stood here almost two years ago on this red dot with a super proud and tear-stained big sister sitting just down there because I know it's no longer an option. We may have many, many difficult journeys ahead of us. We may have mountains to climb. Sometimes we may be chased out of fields by angry cows. And we can't be afraid to burn a well-rehearsed talk that is no longer fit for purpose. We have to remain focused. Focused on what we desire for ourselves. And I know we can do it. I know that we can secure peace. Every thing, single thing begins in the imagination. And it's alive in mine. And we will remain united in the truest sense of the word. Because friends, I truly believe that failure is not an option.